All right. If you're a Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. How many are enjoying the study in Daniel? Daniel's great. Amen. Daniel is for people who have a brain because it is deep. How many say that? Daniel is deep. Daniel stretch you. But it's good stuff. We're living in the last days, and we need to know what's happening. So we'll, we'll be motivated to, how I know, we need to be motivated to tell others about Jesus. Because there's this, as we're studying right now, the Antichrist. I mean, that's not fun, but it's good because we need to know what's coming. And those of us who are in Christ, how many know we're not going to see the Antichrist? Amen. But uh, those who do not know Christ are going to go through the tribulation. They're going to see the Antichrist. They're going to be tempted to follow the Antichrist. But we want to warn people. Amen. We want to tell people to receive Jesus so no one has to go through the tribulation. Amen. Amen. So we want as many people. I love what one person said, that the Christian life, it's like we're in a sinking ship, the earth, that's going down, and we're trying to throw out the life preserver as many, as many people as possible before it sinks. How many know that? That's what we're doing. So we want to tell people about Jesus. And uh, how many want to hear a joke today? You want to hear a joke? I got a couple jokes, I think. <laughs> got to beat Kevin, you know, with the joke thing. Four men are in the hospital waiting room because their wives are having babies. A nurse goes to the first guy and says, congratulations, you're the father of twins. He said, that's odd, uh, the man said. I work for the Minnesota Twins. There you go. So, and then the nurse uh, says to the second guy, congratulations, you're the father of triplets. And the guy says, man, that's weird. Uh, I work for 3M Company. Then the nurse says to the third man, congratulations, you're the father of quadruplets. And he goes, man, that is really strange because I work for Four Seasons Hotel. Then the last man is groaning and banging his head against the wall, and they say, what's wrong? He says, well, I work for 7-Up. <laughs> there's another one. I'll give you another one here. That was kind of weak. But he says, a son said to his dad, I'll be good, dad, for 20 bucks. And the dad responded, oh, yeah? When I was your age, I was good for nothing. A dad said to his son, you'll never amount to anything because you're a procrastinator. The son said, oh, yeah, dad, just you wait. <laughs> you'll get that later. So there you go. Enough of the jokes. I think Kevin beats me, doesn't he? Kevin does a good job. He does. He's a lot cuter than me, too. All right. Uh, the title of today's message is the, son, the Man of Sin, Part 4. Man of Sin, Part 4. And uh, let's pray and ask God to just continue to minister to us. Father, thank you for this sweet time of worship, and thank you that, Lord, even though the oceans of the last days are here, and, and we see the craziness of uh, the fear and the, and the terrorism and the financial worries, but thank you, Lord, that you help us to keep our eyes above the waves, amen, yes. and that we see your good, Lord. We see that you're faithful, and we know that, Lord, no matter what, I love, as Pastor Chuck would always say, that this is the worst it's ever going to get. It's only going to get better. And so, Father, help us to believe that, Lord. That as we live for you, Lord, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I pray that none of us here would be afraid. That we would, we would be concerned. We'd pray for our loved ones that don't know you and our, law, our friends and coworkers. But, Lord, we would not walk in fear. Because we know that you are with us and you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So, Father, I pray that you would just give us, Lord, peace. And not a peace that's complacent, not a, not, a, not a calm that just sits back, but a peace to where we know we're secure in Christ. But Lord, we want to see our loved ones that don't know you secure in Christ. We want to see our friends who don't know you to know you. We want to see our coworkers know you. Lord, give us your heart. As you said, you came to seek and to save that which is lost. Give us a heart that we would not want to see anyone, not even our enemy, go through the tribulation. Give us your heart to share in these last days that you are coming back soon and we need to be ready. We need to be ready for your return and be living right. So Father, speak today. Thank you that your word is blessed. I pray, Lord, that you would bless my tongue to rightly divide your word, not add to it and most definitely not shrink back from giving the whole counsel of God. We love you and we praise you and we commit this time to you. And everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Verse 38 of Daniel chapter 11. But in their place, he, the Antichrist, shall honor a god of fortress or forces, or in some King James, it says in your margin, munitions. 
He shall honor the God of fortress or forces or munitions, the God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, hear that, with precious stones and pleasant things. The Antichrist will come at first, as we know, as a loving world leader that brings everyone together. But when people get wise to him, how many know he's going to change? Amen. He's going to come as this loving figure that unites the whole world. But all of a sudden, he's going about three and a half years into the tribulation. It's going to turn from the tribulation period to the great tribulation. Does anyone know why it turns to the great tribulation? Does anyone know? It's because Satan, or the Antichrist, sets up an image of himself in the temple and then says, hey, guess what? God is not God. I'm God. Worship me. And if you don't worship me, you'll be persecuted, you'll be killed. And if you don't take my mark, you'll be killed. And so people are starting to see this and going, oh my, this is not what we, what we signed up for. Amen? How many know that? A lot of things, you know, I love what one person said this. How many saw the Truth Project? You remember the Truth Project? He said something really good. Dale Tackett said, if you allow the government to be your God, he says, they want, you want the government to pay for your school, pay your housing, do everything, then guess what? The government will then demand for you to worship them as God. Amen? And so hear that. How many want God to be God? Amen? Amen? I want God to be God, not the government, not any other person, not the Antichrist. And so hear that. The people start to become wise to him that he's going to now start forcing his ways on people. And he will need to worship the God of military might, the God of force, to keep everyone in line. And how many know that? That's why you see, isn't it crazy, how our Second Amendment is guns. And what was the reason? What, what, did, what did our even Thomas Jefferson, who's kind of a liberal president, what did he say? He said the tree of liberty needs to be watered by the blood of patriots. And that means is that we need to be able to say to government, enough. But guess what? What happens? You want to take guns away because why? Then the government has absolute power. Now, I'm not saying, I don't hear me, you didn't hear me say rebel against the government, but do you understand? That's what our country believed, that a government need to be held in check, and that's what happens. You take that power away, and then the, all the government has the power, then guess what? You can be overtaken. The God of force or military might is an expensive God indeed. That's why he says silver and gold. Hear this. Did you know this? I mean, you know that military stuff costs a lot of money, but I was just looking this up. Just one thing, the B-2 stealth bomber. Does anyone know, have any idea how much one B-2 stealth bomber costs? Anyone? How much? Two billion. Two billion. You are the man. Two billion dollars. Two billion. And I read a statistic. I don't know if it was wrong. It says just the maintenance or staff and maintenance a month is three million dollars. Wow. Now, Stealths are cool, though. they got to give them that, right? I mean, but, but hear this, and I, I believe in military, but I mean, you know that's expensive. So he has to have a lot of silver and gold because he has to have his military might to uh, promote his uh, takeover of the world. Verse 39, thus he shall act against the strongest fortress with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Antichrist will use his God of military might to dominate the world. But as I said at first, his initial, uh, initially he depended on his charisma, his flattery, his talk of world peace. You know, we said, right, there's the theory that why he'll be accepted by the Jews is because he'll be able to uh, bring the Jews and, and the Arabs or Islamics together. He'll be able to bring them and have maybe, you've heard the temple is, or the Dome of the Rock is in the outer courts. And so there could be a temple right next to it. He could build a wall and say, hey, and think about it. He would be an amazing le leader, at least to the world, if he could do that, right? So he's going to look really good at first. But now he's just beginning to dominate by flexing his military might. And how many know that's true for today? How many know that a lot of agendas start off really good and then they get really bad? How many know, have heard of the agenda possibly of tolerance? How many know tolerance is a good thing? It really is. Because tolerance, the real definition, the original definition meant what? We agree to disagree. But I respect you as a human being, so even though I disagree with you strongly, I respect your right to be wrong. <laughs> That's a joke. All right. But you know, I respect you. I respect you. Even though I don't agree with your lifestyle, I respect you. But how many know that agenda is changing? How many know tolerance is now you will believe what we say you should believe and you'll stop believing what you believe? How many know that's the new tolerance? 
You say, oh, I don't know about that. Well, let me read to you. I want you to hear this. I, I've quoted it, but I've quoted it just kind of off the top of my head. Here's what Justice Alito said. Our Supreme Court Justice said back in 2005, or 2015, January, about same-sex marriage. Here's what he said. I assume that those who cling to old beliefs, that's traditional marriage, will be able to whisper, hear that, whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. You hear that? So it's basically shut up and just whisper it quietly in your homes because that's all you can do. But if they repeat those views, the biblical worldview, in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by the government, by the employers, and by schools. Pretty much, do you see the pressure? So everything is going to try to pressure you to believe and conform to the world. How many have a problem with that? But that's how the agenda goes. It starts off nice. It starts off with tolerance. It sounds good. But then it gets radical and says, if you don't comply, you will be punished. And you've seen that with the bakeries and all the crazy stuff out there. Verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. The Egyptians, remember the Ptolemy family? The Egyptians and Arabs will begin to wage war against Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation period, of the great tribulation. Because why? They've seen him now, his true colors. They've seen him say, hey, I'm God. And guess what? They're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not the good guy we thought you were. You are not this world leader that brings peace. You are now dominating us and you're oppressing us like any other world dominating leader. And so they start to fight against him. And here it is, middle of verse 40. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, or even 37, we know that the king of the north here does not mean the Assyrians. But it's talking now about the Russians. Gog and Magog, the Russians. Verse 41, he shall also enter the glorious land. The glorious land. How many know what the glorious land is? Anyone have any idea? That is what? Israel. It's also called the pleasant land in Daniel 8, 9. Chapter 8, verse 9. And that is Israel. He's going to go for the pleasant land. Does anyone know why Antichrist wants to go for the pleasant land? Does anyone know why? why, Has anyone been to Israel? Been there? If you've been to Israel, you look at it, you kind of go... Man, it's nice, but I mean, this is with the Lord, but it's, I mean, it's a lot like Tucson. In some ways, it's even drier and more arid. So you kind of go, man, why is this such a popular place? And why is it such a politically hot place? And it's because why? Because Jesus is going to come back in the millennial kingdom and set up his throne in Jerusalem. Amen? And so the enemy, Satan, says, man, if I can take over Israel, if I can destroy the Jews, then it'll be hard for him to come back. Isn't it amazing that Satan believes he can do that? And you say, oh, that's silly. I don't know. He doesn't think that, does he? Yes, he does. Because if you go to Israel, you'll see the eastern gate, and it's all bricked up. The Turks, the Muslim Turks have bricked it up because the Lord's going to come through the eastern gate. And so he's going to come through, and they brick it up thinking they're going to stop the Lord from returning. Because, you know, God can't go through bricks. You know, but and then they also because if you know he's a he's a Jewish man or a priest can't touch a grave, so they put a bunch of graves right in front of it. But you know what's cool? The Bible says in Ezekiel, where is it? I I got ahead of myself. It's Ezekiel. Where is it? Ezekiel. 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 Zechariah. Zechariah fourteen four. It's not in your notes up there. Zechariah fourteen four says that he'll come back. And he'll split open the Mount of Olives. So he's just going to basically say, oh, graves in the way, bricks in the way, like this, and just split it open and go through. How many like your God? How many of your God is the one true God? And so pretty cool. But that's why Satan wants Israel so bad. That's why there's such an anti-Semitic, even now in our PC society, there's such a hatred for the Jews because it's a hatred that the devil has because he knows that Jesus is going to set up his throne in Israel and Jerusalem. Middle of verse 41 And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, prominent people of Ammon. Verse 42, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Verse 43, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. 
Verse 44, but news, hear that, but news from the east and north shall trouble him. News. We see, as I said, the Russians are now coming. How many know Putin's a pretty, you know, have, have, you, seen, have you seen the picture of Putin and how tough he is? You know, seen, no, I've already been quiet. I'm going to say something here. I was, but, but Putin's a pretty tough guy. He was KGB, you know, he, he's a pretty, you know, you see him riding his horse back with no shirt on. You know, I mean, he's a tough guy. Russians, you know, so the Russians are coming again. But hear this. Now, for you students of prophecy who know Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Russians, a lot of scholars believe, come at the beginning of the tribulation period. How many saw that in the member of the, the Left Behind series? You see the, 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 the Russians, they come against Israel, and all of a sudden they're just kind of wiped out miraculously. That's, that, that was at the beginning. But they are wiped out. But now, at the three and a half years, into the Great Tribulation, which is called, as I said, the Great Tribulation. Here the Russians have regrouped. At least three and a half years have gone by. They've kind of regrouped, and they're coming down against Israel again. At this point, Antichrist is troubled because out of the east he hears, verse 44, the news of, and here's what the news is, it's Revelation 9.16, tells him that the news is the king of the east is coming, and not just the Russians, but now the Chinese. The Chinese are coming again. So guess what? Antichrist has got people not liking. Isn't that amazing? That even though he's the god of this world, he's, as, as, as Paul said, and Jesus said, the prince of this world, that the world is starting to get sick of even the devil. Isn't that amazing? And that the people are rising up. So the, the king of the east is coming with an army here that's just a small little army of only 200 million men. Isn't that amazing? A two- Hundred million man army. When Revelation was written, John must have thought he heard wrong because at that time the population was probably only about 200 million people. So he's thinking, how could there be an army of 200 million men? But as some of you know, in the 1960s, Radio Peking announced on the radio that China had established a militia of 200 million men that could be summoned in less than a month. Two hundred million men. Suddenly, people who were studying prophecy took notice. How many, how many love that history proves the Bible, Bible, you know, history doesn't disprove the Bible, it only proves the Bible true. I, I love what someone said once that the, the, the Bible is the anvil that has worn out many a hammer. And how many know that? I mean, it's just constantly. And you think this is written thousands of years before it happened, and everything's just coming true, coming true, coming true, coming true. Back then, John would have said, you know, how many, how many know it's easy to give a word that makes sense, but if you give a prophetic word that says a 200 million man army and there isn't 200 million people on the earth, that's going to stretch your faith. But it's true now, amen? Here we see not only the Russians and the Arabs pinching at Antichrist, but now, as I said, the Chinese as well. No wonder Antichrist is troubled. He sees his world empire of one world order crumbling away or slipping away. Middle of verse 44. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. Although Antichrist... You know, he, he, Antichrist now lashes out at the world indiscriminately. He just lashes out. He's angry. His anger will be particularly, as I said, directed towards the Jews. And we need to know that. And hear this, guys. I pray that all of you here love the Jewish people. Amen? Even if they're not following God, they're still his chosen people. And how many know true Israel will come back? Amen? In Romans 11, they're going to come back. And guess what? Blessed are the people, you know, who bless Israel. Right? And, and as it says in uh, Genesis 12, 3, it says, I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. How many know we, with all our troubles, do not need to curse Israel? And we got to get past just saying, oh, yeah, we're for Israel, and then give our, their enemies $150 billion, right? we got to care about Israel. We've got to care. We've got to pray. And how many know if you pray, uh, Psalms, I think it's 122, says if you, he'll bless those who, who pray for Israel. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There's a blessing that comes for that. We need to pray that. You know, it's hard. It's funny. A part of me, it's this was so funny. I always told the Lord, I want the peace of Jerusalem, but I kind of want things to get crazy because I want to go home. Yeah. And so I'm torn. You know what I mean? Protect them, but let it get, let's get going. You know? But anyways, so I don't know what to do. Verse 45, and he shall plant 
the tents of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. No one will help him. How many like that? I like that. No one's going to help him. He's going to finally be on his own. You know? Sometimes I think everyone helps the, the, the devil, but now he, everyone's sick of him. Antichrist will make his headquarters in the valley of Megiddo, or Megiddo, I should say. And uh, Armag- how many have heard of Armageddon, right? Heard of Armageddon? Where the final battle unfold. Can you show that picture? There it is. Can you see that? That right there, that's the tell. That's Solomon's little palace thing. But that's Megiddo, or Megiddo. That is, uh, it looks like Tucson. It's amazing. Does, can you see? It's a little greener than Tucson because they have a lot of water there. But how many know if that if you looked off of Mount Lemmon or Push Ridge and you looked at uh, looked at Tucson with no with no buildings, that's pretty much what it is. You see the mountains in the back, kind of like Tucson. And I was just going, my goodness, think about that. Napoleon supposedly stood on this tell and said this would be the perfect place for the battle of all battles. I mean, Napoleon said that. And how many know that we're going to see in a moment? Look at how huge that is. That's not even showing all of it, but it's pretty big. But it says the blood will be as high as the horse's bridle. The battle of all bellies. Think about it, 200 million men and then all the other Arabs and all the other people. There will be blood four feet deep in that valley. How many know you don't want anyone to be there? I don't want to be there, right? Well, we're going to be there, but we're going to be on the horses coming and taking names and, you know, Whatever. <laughs> The armies of the world will converge to destroy him, Antichrist. And no one will help him. He'll have his weapons, he'll have all his munitions. But hear this, let's look at verse 40 again. Look, if you would, go back to verse 40. And it says, The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. Now, hear this, John didn't know how to describe tanks and military stuff, so he had to use what he had. But how many know when it says horses, you kind of go, horses, really? I, I don't think horses in 2016, horses, really? But how many know, did anyone, how many old timers out there ever saw the movie Thief in the Night? Anyone see the movie Thief in the Night? Okay, just my wife. And you saw it? Okay, good. Two old people here. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't have to tell you. New person, old person, what are you talking about? No. But if you saw that movie, it was pretty scary. I, got, I was newly saved. I was like three weeks old in the Lord, and I saw this movie. <laughs> and I mean, I'm like, what did I get into? I mean, it's showing people get their heads chopped off with guillotines and chopped off with swords. How many know 34 years ago when I got saved, that was weird? But how many know chop, heads chopped off is not too weird nowadays? I mean, it's still sick and wrong, but how many know it's, we go, that could happen, right? We are barbaric, right? There's, well, not, you know, but there's people who do that stuff. And they are a peaceful religion. Just know that. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, you don't laugh at that. You guys are PC. I can't say that truth. I'm sorry. No. But how many know that's pretty wild? That, 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 you know, so what I'm saying is when the Bible says something, unless it's a metaphor, we should take it literally. And when the Bible says they'll be on horses, we should maybe say they're on horses. I, I, a commentator said that. I thought it really made sense. Think about it. It says, the blood will flow at Armageddon up to the horse's bridle four feet. And that's in Revelation 14, 20. Is it just figuratively? Is it just poetic? Or are, they really going to, are there really going to be horses in the great battle at, the, at Armageddon? And now think about this. It makes sense to me. Could it be that their munitions or all the special weaponry that we have is rendered inoperable because of what? An EMP? How many know an EMP? Electric magnetic, magnetic, electric magnetic pulse. You know, it hit me right now. Then okay, but where it just fries everything. Isn't that scary? I mean, I mean, we shouldn't walk in fear, but that's pretty intense. That they can do a bomb over us. I think it's I don't know if it's a neutron bomb, is a neutron something just, boom, and then it can just wipe out everything. The only thing that won't be affected will be like old trucks, like past the '60s, they don't have electronic ignition, all that weirdness. But pretty much everything we have will stop. Your phone. Your water, your everything. How many know that could freak us out? You know, I, but how many know this? Can I just say this? this is just totally free. I know a lot of you say don't give free things because that's when you get scary. But how many know that might be the very thing that church needs? How many know all this technology is good, but a lot of that is a big distraction from us seeking God? 
Do you remember the old days when you used to actually have your Bible and just you and God and the Bible? How, how, you know, it was a little harder studying back then. It really was. If you study, you had to have a lot of books all spread out. But, but how do you know? You know, when I study at my computer, I got pop-ups, you know, telling me, hey, you know, email this and do this and don't do I mean, ah, you know, sometimes the EMP might not be the worst thing that could happen to us. But hear this. It could be an EMP, and then we're rendered back to simple days of just horses and maybe simple guns and, and, and all this. And just a thought. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord, that the Bible doesn't talk about EMPs. But I'm, I'm thinking that maybe that's why there might be horses. There might be swords. There might be just simple guns because just because of an EMP. When things get down to the end times, all the computer-based weaponry could be rendered useless. With sophisticated weapons made useless, soldiers would be reduced to using, as I said, horses and swords and simple guns. You know, even the zip, you know, even the little uh, mini guns, you know, the really fast ones that do like 6,000 rounds a minute, even that is electronic primer, isn't it? Even that has electronic primer. So that wouldn't even work. So you would have a lot of things would just be totally gone if that happened. So they would go back to simple weaponry. We don't know... Um, we do know that right when it looks like the whole world is particularly Israel would be devastated at Armageddon, Jesus will come back suddenly. How am excited about that? Jesus is going to come back suddenly. Don't you like I always like that. I always like when the Bible says, but God. How many like that? You know, he's like, oh, it's over. And that's why we shouldn't sweat because it isn't over till Jesus comes back. Not the fat lady, but till Jesus comes back. It isn't over. Till it's over. How many, how many know that? You know, people were sweating the disciples, and then all of a sudden, Jesus raised from the dead. We have to believe that. You know, sometimes we always think, oh, it's Friday, Jesus is dead, oh, it's Friday. But we got to remember, as this old black preacher said, you're really good. But a Sunday's a coming. Amen. And we got to believe that. We got to believe that God is working all things together for good. And even though it looks like everything's dark and Israel's going to be destroyed, suddenly Jesus comes back. And who's, guess who's going to be with him? You and I. You ever really heard the song, Stephen Camp, saddle up your horses, right? Amy's going to be ready riding her horse, right? I mean, we are going to be riding horses. Jesus is going to be leading the way. We're going to be with him. How many know that? And think about that. I love one commenter said, literal horses. I was thinking about Gandalf. Have you ever, ever seen Lord of the Rings with Gandalf with the white horse? Remember that? And he has his horse, the king of all horses. Isn't that weird? Jesus literally has a horse, you know? I wonder if he goes... You know, does a special whistle, but I mean, he has a horse that he's just going to ride in on. Isn't that cool? No? Okay. I, I thought it was cool, Craig, but I mean, it's pretty cool. And I wonder if he doesn't have to hold the reins. He can just ride it, and the horse does whatever he wants. I mean, pretty cool stuff. Jude 1.14 says this, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of, of his saints. That's you and I. We're going to come with the Lord, and, and, and he's going to come back, and we get to come back with him as he, inv- he comes and takes out the, the enemies at Armageddon. At these, these, all these armies will stop fighting each other and start fighting the Lord. Needless to say, they will not have a prayer. Amen? And you ever, you ever remember the commercial, it's not good to mess with Mother Nature? I mean, no, it's really not good to mess with Jesus Christ, right? And so they're going to try to say, hey, let's turn to, against the Lamb. Let's turn against Jesus. And hear this, guys. I know that this is going to happen. Just as Daniel said. Now, you might be saying, well, Pastor, how do you know this? How do you know all this is going to happen this way? Well, the first 34 verses of chapter 11 of Daniel were fulfilled perfectly. Remember I told you 100, over 135 verses or, ch- or prophecies were fulfilled perfectly. And guess what? The remaining prophecies of Daniel will be fulfilled perfectly too. And you need to rest in that. But hear this, guys. Hear this. That you need to hear this. That, that this message and messages like this should motivate you to know that Jesus is coming back soon. And that you want to tell people. Because I want to tell you this. The Bible says this, in the last days, men's hearts will wax cold. How many feel that? You can just feel the pressure to wax cold to say, I'm going to bunker down. I'm going to hide out. I'm going to get away from people because people hurt me. 
Why do you think it says in, in, in Hebrews 10.25, Let us not forsake fellowshipping with one another, which is a custom of some, especially as the day of the Lord approaches. Because why? The temptation will be, I just don't want to mess with people. I don't want to go to church. I'm too afraid. Uh, you know, something could happen. People could be mean to me, and we want to hide out. How many know that when the Bible says don't do it, that means the temptation is going to be there, but we've got to say, no, I'm going to fellowship. Because I know, I mean, I know it's not you guys, but the first service, a lot of people want to sleep in. And a lot of those people, we don't have a first service for those, you know. But, you know, we used to. I always blame the first service or the second service or whatever service you were. But how many know this? That, that we want, we're tempted to sleep in, aren't we? We're tempted, I'll just watch Robert Furrow on the, on the show. He's better anyway. You know, we just, we're tempted to do that. But how many know we need fellowship? And we need to be around people. We need to be engaged with people. I'm not saying be dumb, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying go take a ticket to Iran and start talking. I'm saying we need to be sh- smart, but how many know we should care about those around us? And we should tell people about Jesus. And we should tell. Remember, the, you remember the Jesus movement? You know, he's coming back. Maranatha. We always told. We were so excited about the Lord's return. And we need to get back to that because guess what? The Lord's return is a lot closer today than it was 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And we need to know that. And we need to be excited. But we say, what, what's the temptation? It says in Peter in the last days, man, we've been talking about the Lord's return for 40 years and he hasn't come, so why, you know, I don't know. He might not come, whatever. And have that Eeyore heart. We need to say the Lord's coming back. And how many know you see things happening and you go, my goodness, right? You, you see it and you go, my goodness, look at what's happening here. And we need to be encouraged that as things get worse, that means the Lord's return is coming closer. His, his, you know, when you see all these rumors of war and earthquakes, that re- look up for your redemption draweth near. So what's the answer? Be afraid. No, can't just eat. What's the answer? The answer is we need to be ready. Amen? We need to be ready. We need to tell our friends and family members to be ready. Because as we saw this, and hear this, guys, if you're here today, as we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, if you weren't here last week, you can listen to it online. But if you're in church and you're playing games with God, don't think, well, when I see the rapture and everyone's gone, I'll come back here and then I'll get serious with God. Do you remember what it said, what, what God said through Paul? He said, because you rejected truth, because you live for pleasure, evil, it says, I think it says, I forget what it says, uh, unrighteous pleasures, then God will hand you over to a strong delusion. Does that scare anyone, or is it just me? So guess what God's saying to you and I? If you're playing games with God today, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to get right so that you will not get caught. Because if you get stuck in the tribulation, especially if you've been going to church for years, there's a good chance you're not going to see the truth. You're going to be deceived. Read 2 Thessalonians. Listen to last week's message. But guess what? Today's the day to give your life to God. Today's the day to receive Christ if you don't know him. Today's the day to say, I want to live right so I can tell my friends, I can tell my family members, I can tell my coworkers about Jesus. And hear this, guys, that even though the agenda is keep it in your closet, keep it in your homes, like you remember Alito, keep it in the recess of your homes. How many know Jesus said you're to go into highways and byways and tell everyone? So who should we obey, God or man? And we should say, I'm going to speak the truth in love. Now, now, don't not work and get fired because you're speaking. But how many know you have time at lunch, right? You, you have time to call someone. You have time to invite someone to coffee. But guess what, guys? You know how the church is supposed to be built? Not with cool lights, not with a coffee bar, but it's supposed to be you guys. You guys going out to the highways and byways and sharing the love of Jesus with people. That's what it is. And guess what? How, how, how many know there's a little pressure out there to shut your yapper? But guess what? You need to say, I will speak the truth because Jesus has told me to. And don't think you're the only ones. Because remember remember in Acts, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And that was the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees, the Sadducees said, stop it. And they said, sorry, (laughs) who should we obey, God or man? How many of those are time to rebel against the authorities? When they tell you to do something that goes against the word, you can lovingly say, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick God. You do what you got to do. And we have to do that and hear that. And can I say one last thing here, this? Because I know we're tempted to be PC because, you know, we'd say, oh, God would never want me to lose my job. God would never want me to suffer. Do you realize? Hear this, guys. I have to say it's over. During the Roman Christians in Rome, Caesar said, 
if you pinch, did a pinch to Caesar, a little statue of Caesar said, Caesar is a Lord, you could get a get out of persecution card or certificate for a year. All you had to do is just say, Caesar, not is the only Lord, he is Lord. That's all you had to say. He is a Lord. But Christians would not do that. And Christians were killed by the hundreds of thousands. Now think about that. If Christians were willing to die to say Jesus is the only Lord, how much more should we be willing to die to speak the truth of Jesus to our friends and family members and to coworkers? We've got to, you understand, we can't, as J.B. Phillips says in Romans 12, 1, we can't let this world conform us into its image no matter how much pressure it puts. Because you're not going to be able to blame it on your boss. Jesus is going to say, why didn't you obey me? And why didn't you trust me? Amen? Amen. We've got to trust God. And we've got to stop being the church that's afraid and start being the church that's bold again in love. Amen? Amen. Bold again in love. Well, we're going to take communion. And before we do, I want to give you an opportunity. You know, we believe strongly in Romans 11 that says if you take communion in an unworthy manner, that you, many of you, it says, are weak and sick and even sleep. And that word sleep in the Greek means death. How many do not want to die during communion here? Right? Okay, so that means you want to be right with God. Okay, so we want communion to be a blessing. So that means that if you're not right with God, then you'll take this time to get right. Confess whatever sin you know of, you're aware of. And then if you don't know Jesus, we have open communion, but all we ask is that you receive Christ. Amen. It's hard to commune with a Jesus you don't know. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm not going to have you pray out loud, but just pray quietly in your heart with me, or you can quietly whisper it out loud. But just pray this prayer. Can someone get the lights? And just pray this prayer with me if you would. And I'm going to pray a prayer for two groups. Those who need to receive Christ, maybe for the first time, and those who need to recommit their life. That maybe you've been like the prodigal son. You've been one foot in the world, one foot in the church. You're as James says, you're a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways. And how many know if we're going to be bold, we've got to be living right. Amen? Amen. And so I want us to, to do that right now. Just pray this prayer with me if you would out loud. You know, just quietly out loud. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. And cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I give you my heart. And I ask you to save me either for the first time or, Lord, today I recommit my life to you. But from this day forward, I want to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and cleanse me and wash me with your precious blood. Forgive me for all my failures. Forgive me for not obeying you like I know I should. Wash me afresh. Give me a new start in you, and may I follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for receiving me back. For it's in Jesus' name I ask, Father. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, or you prayed that prayer to recommit your life, how many know you're ready to take communion? And we're going to take communion the ushers are going to pass out. The, the worship team is going to play a song. The ushers are going to pass out the bread and the juice. Just hold it in your hands. And then we will take communion together as a church.